Oh, yes indeed. Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 BMW XM. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out looks on the inside and outside. This is an important model. It's the first M exclusive vehicle since the M1 supercar of the 1970s. And for that, they went with an SUV. Interesting. Up at the front, we find a mega sized kidney grill that illuminates at night. XM lettering in gold. That's baked onto a black gloss face to contrast this Marina Bay Blue metallic paint that looks good even on a cloudy day like today. Down low is functional ventilation. There's a duct off to the left to a heat exchanger. And on the right, that duct is blocked off. The headlight design is borrowed from the new X7 and 7 series, splitting the LED daytime running lights and turn signals above LED projector headlights down low. Then further down, there are functional corner vents. At the side, we find a set of 22 inch aerodynamic wheels, but you can choose 23 inch wheels. They're wrapped in Pirelli P0 tires, 275 section front and 315 at the rear. Within those wheels are six piston front brakes with black painted calipers. There's more gloss black for the wheel arches and lower sills. In addition to this stripe that's running from just above the charge port door all the way to the back pillar. And I'm not sure how I feel about that design. You can get it in gold, in case that makes it better for you. Gloss black for the mirror caps and window trim. Stepping back to look at the profile, we can see that this is in fact a large SUV. Shares its platform with the X7, but it's a bit shorter, a little lower to the ground, a little wider as well. And getting to the back, here is for me the most controversial angle on this SUV, because it's very humped, kind of like the last generation Honda CRV. There are thin LED taillights and turn signals. There's another XM logo, not perfectly in between the rear taillights, just off to the left and no BMW badge at all on the tailgate. Instead, you find them as decals on the upper corners of the back glass. That's all above black gloss for the lower bumper and a stacked tailpipe design that I think looks awesome. In fact, the full rear end, the more I've looked at it, the more I like it. I think what's controversial for me is that it doesn't seem to go with the rest of the exterior design. Am I crazy? Is that just me? I wanna hear from you guys. Do you think this looks cool or are they trying too hard? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside at this silver stone and vintage coffee leather interior, there's a cool geometric pattern on the headliner. It's suede wrapped and there's ambient lighting. Quilting on the seats extends all the way out to here and we can't forget our lumbar pillows because we're fancy. On the doors are two tones of that leather. There's more quilting. Leather extends all the way down here. We've got one touch up down windows, these mega storage cubbies inside the door and it upgraded Bowers and Wilkins 1,475 watt diamond surround sound system. Stepping in behind my own seat at six feet tall, I've got acres of leg room, quilting on the map pocket, big foot pockets to slide my feet under. Thigh support is excellent. And headroom is as well. Got plenty of that, and I'm rocking a nice recline back here. There are two air vents in the middle. We've got a four zone climate control system, rear heated seats, little storage cubby, USB-C ports, and a DC outlet down there. And there are two more USB-C ports, one on the back of each seat. Getting into the middle is not hard. The drive shaft hump is nice and low. And once again, my head clears under this very cool headliner. The only things I would add back here would be rear entertainment screens, or better yet, the mega screen from the new 7 series. Otherwise, it's quite luxurious. Door closed noise is solid. Smart Keel Sentry is only for the front two doors, and compared to the back seats, the front seats are heated, ventilated, and massaging. Plus, they've got these illuminating BMW XM radio. Sorry, just XM logos. Winglets for your shoulders, power adjusting side bolsters, lumbar controls down there, aluminum M tread plates, aluminum accented foot pedals. The front doors look very similar to the back. They just add power adjusting and power folding door mirrors, two position memory for the front seats, and this release for the tailgate. 
where inside we find 19 cubic feet of space behind that second row and what looks to be a very fancy XM bag, but in fact holds your charging cables. If you needed more cargo space, you would want to fold down the rear seats 40, 20, 40, but you couldn't do it from back here because there are no power or manual controls from the trunk. This is bizarre on a $160,000 SUV that you would either have to stretch out some very long arms to release the latches or go to the back doors to fold the seats almost completely flat. You do thankfully have power close and lock as a function of the tailgate. And as we nestle into the driver's seat, we find a heated leather wrap steering wheel. It's nice and thick like all M products with a contrasting stitch inside with the M colors. We've got these two customizable M buttons and these carbon fiber faced paddles with this texturing on the back. There's more matte carbon fiber around this curved glass display that encompasses a digital instrument cluster that's reconfigurable and a 14.9 inch touchscreen running the latest iDrive 8 software. It's vivid, it's very easy to use, and it's got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. To the right of the screen is more sumptuous leather with contrast stitching and M logo, and we can see some of the ambient lighting even showing up here during the day. There's a knurled finish volume knob, seat controls, and then these are only HVAC controls for defrost that are physical. The rest are found in the infotainment system. They do pop up pretty easily, but it's still more distracting while driving than a physical button. Matte carbon fiber trim is under the screen. Slide it forward to find a wireless smartphone charging pad, DC outlet, USB-A port, and heated and cooled cup holders as standard. There's an M-specific gear selector with contrast stitching. We've got this dial here to control the infotainment system if you don't want to touch the screen. And then under the leather top console is just a little bit of storage with a USB-C port. Down, I say. Visibility is okay until you get to that back pillar. That is a big blind spot. Thankfully, there's standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. On the whole, this cabin is an interesting mix of the iX and the X7, more heavily weighted towards the luxury than the M. I mean, there is the cool thick steering wheel, the carbon fiber, and the sports seats, but it feels more stylized and plush than it does feel super performancey. But we need to take it for a drive now and see what that tells us. All right, let's fire it up. So we had a mix there of startup chimes and futuristic sound effects, but we heard nothing from the twin turbo V8 because the XM is starting life as an EV. And with that, we've got a whole new set of driving configurations in addition to all the usual M stuff. So if you hit the setup button, this is where you'll see the drivetrain setup. Now you can have two different levels of braking regeneration. We're gonna start in the minimum level. Your chassis, steering, braking, your all-wheel drive system, where you can have it in full all-wheel drive, a rear biased all-wheel drive system, or a low level traction mode. And then if I hit the M mode button, this gives us two options, road or sport. See how that changes the gauge cluster. And then I want it to be in road, thank you. And then this new M hybrid setting, which will give you three options. Hybrid, where it'll just sort of use the energy at its discretion, EV mode, or e-control mode, which will hold on to that charge for a later date. We'll start in electric mode, just pure EV, and then go over and up for reverse. That brings up a high resolution backup camera with trajectory lines. Got your bird's eye view over here. You can see a 3D projection of the car and scan your way around the exterior or use gestures if I can get this to do it right yeah kind of this is just let's just try this and then we've got a backup assist function which will take you out of your parking space along the same path you took to get into it this is handy if you're in a really tight spot or if you forgot how to drive somehow since you parked then it's over to drive, and away we go. Let's start things off with the world famous horn test. Ooh, wow. That's, that's a very trumpeted horn. Didn't expect that. 
And before we go any further or do the turn signal sound, I want to point out that we've got an estimated range of 38 miles because that's more than the EPA estimate of 31 miles. And when I first unplugged this vehicle with 100% charge, it said we'd have 44 miles. So that's pretty good. Turn signal sound. That is more classic BMW. The horn, I don't know where that came from. Now for that powertrain. We have two things at play here. We've got a 4.4 liter twin turbocharged V8. That's mated to an electric motor and a 25.7 kilowatt hour battery pack. That combines for 644 horsepower and 590 pound feet of torque. Routed through an eight speed automatic gearbox to all four tires. Now, while that twin turbo V8 is slumbering, the XM behaves like a typical EV. Got smooth acceleration, instant torque, enough power to get you up to speed easily here. And as long as you don't go all the way on the throttle to the kick down, it will stay in EV mode. But if you do go kick down, the gas engine triggers on. Then you gotta go back to setup, or rather M hybrid and choose electric mode once more. At this minimum level of braking regeneration, when I pull my foot off the throttle, little to no slowing happens. And then if I go to max, the name is a bit misleading as max because there's still minimal levels of slowing from regeneration that happens. This is not your typical one pedal drive setup here. And I feel like the miss, that's a missed opportunity because you can use one pedal driving in a performance environment as well. And it'd be nice to kind of recoup a lot of energy that you use, especially considering you only have, you know, between 30 and 40 miles of EV range. It is nice to have that much so that for most people you can get to work and maybe even to and from work if you've got a short commute. And it's nice to have the all electric driving just for the, the smoothness and quiet factor. The seats are very comfortable, tons of adjustability here. We'll see how they hold me in place when we take a corner later. Try a turning radius test now. And that's good. This is a big SUV and it pivots right around thanks to the rear wheel steering system. Turn those rear tires in the opposite direction of the fronts at low speeds. As far as ride quality goes, we have adaptive dampers, but instead of most BMW vehicles that use an air suspension system, the XM has coil springs. And so that helps you feel more connected to the road which benefits the driving experience, but it does mean I feel the road surface changes more than an air suspension system. It doesn't make the ride uncomfortable per se, but when you go over real bumps, there is this booming resonance that enters the cabin and that's kind of disruptive for this trying to be very luxurious and sporty, you sacrifice some of the at ease nature but I think it's time for hybrid mode and for full acceleration as in a real world zero to 60 test. For that, I've got my race box set up over here and then I need to go to setup mode and go to sport plus for the powertrain and put it in M dynamic mode. Or you just have that programmed into one of your M buttons as I've done here. Pressing that twice will confirm M1 and then we'll just use launch control by holding my foot hard on the brake, pinning the throttle, wait for it to say we're good to go and peel my foot off the brake. Here goes. Launch control active. Woo! 3.9 seconds to 60, which is pretty much exactly what BMW is estimating, and that's extra impressive because we started on an uphill. And speaking of the start, it felt a little extra theatrical because there was such a defined lurch through the body, which if you weren't expecting it, as I wasn't the first time I did it. It's a little disorienting. Now, what do we think about the noise? <laughs> yeah, the, the momentum, that's not an issue at all. But the, the soundtrack, 
is a bit artificial, isn't it? And that's because while the vehicle is making a good twin turbo V8 soundtrack from behind it and outside of it, what we're hearing is composed through the speakers. Which makes for a boisterous acoustic environment, but not quite savory, at least not to my ears. Let me know in the comments if you think this sounds awesome. What I do want to try now is manual mode, so I will click the gear selector over to the right, and now I can use these big carbon fiber faced paddles, which have good shift action. And a real thump on every upshift to complement some. I mean, just wild straight line speed. This thing is a force. <laughs> yeah, this is no joke. What about when the road starts to bend? I've turned off traction control to find out. We're gonna carry some real speed into this corner. Hard on those brakes, they clamp down really nicely. Cut in. Wants to plow the nose, but it will tuck the rear end around. You can feel the rear wheel steering system working here. And some real play from this chassis. It danced through that corner. The brakes were strong. The active anti-roll bars helped us pretty flat. There was a little bit of lean, but it was communication through there. I, I gotta do something like that again. All right, round two. Oh, yes indeed. The XM can hustle. 6,100 pounds of weight that we're working with here. And BMW M has managed to not completely make it go away, but to disguise it remarkably well. The limited slip differential got the power to the ground, helped shove us out of the corner. The steering talked a little to me with the buildup of resistance, but more I think it was those steel springs that did transfer the road and what I was experiencing through the chassis, through to my seat. I am, I am properly impressed with this. I didn't anticipate wanting to find good roads in this vehicle. I looked at it, saw the specs, and was like, it's going to be too big and heavy. I'm not going to want to do that, but I really do. In fact, I think my only performance criticism for the XM is this gearbox in certain situations, because I felt like there, the upshifts were almost sluggish. And at low speeds too, that last little bit, as you're coming up to a stop, there's a clunkiness as the gearbox engages or disengages. And that seems like the XM therefore is confused with itself, which now leads me to my miles per hour word of the day, which for the XM is intricate, meaning complicated or highly detailed. There are just so many pieces at play in this SUV. All the different drive modes and settings, the fact that it can be an EV, it can be a hybrid, it can just have twin turbo V8 roar artificially, the fact that it's trying to be very luxurious with this interior, but then the ride is a bit firmer, and then it wants to be very sporty, and it does that really, really well, but it's big and heavy. It, it just seems like it's almost fighting itself, and that's, that's a big obstacle to overcome. And those are not the only obstacles to overcome. There's also the price tag, which I'll share with you in just a sec. First, let's review the fuel economy and top speed. Top speed, if you don't get the $2,500 M driver's package, is 155 miles per hour. If you do get that package, it goes up by 13 to 168 miles per hour. Is that worth it? I don't know, not, not for me. And the fuel economy is 46 combined MPGE, or equivalent, that's if you've got some electric range to use. And if you've fully depleted the battery, then it goes to 19 combined. And the estimate from the APA of the total range, I said, is 31 miles. You can see we've got 27 miles, as it's saying right now, after a lot of driving. So I fully believe at least 31 miles and probably much more. And while we are on the highway, I do want to activate the driving assistance features, which are all standard on the XM, including this assisted driving plus package, 
which is effectively an extended traffic jam assist, which you can use up to speeds around 45 miles per hour. But here at these highway speeds, it's not really intended to be hands-free. I'm just taking the hands off to show you how it navigates situations like that, which it took a sec, but it was able to do it. And we'll also do a lane change assist. But then wants you to have your hands back on the wheel. Apart from bizarre things like departures from the freeway, it does do a great job staying in the center of the lane. And then here listening for the NVH level at these speeds. There's a little wind noise going on at the seams. I mean, this is not a very aerodynamically shaped vehicle, but the road and tire noise is low. Even on this louder road surface that we've now joined up with. So you shouldn't have to raise your voice much to carry on a conversation with your passengers. And that's, that's the mark of a luxury SUV. We've beaten around the bush long enough. It's time to talk pricing and competition for the XM. And the starting figure for this SUV is $160,000. This one as tested is about 168 k And I will say that 160,000 does buy you a lot of standard equipment, but let's see how else you could spend that money in the performance luxury hybrid SUV realm. So there's the Porsche Cayenne Turbo S E-Hybrid that starts at $173,000, makes 670 horsepower, gets to 60 in a scant 3.4 seconds while having a top speed of 182 miles per hour. The MPGE rating is 42 and the E-range is around 20 miles. There's also the Bentley Bentayga Hybrid. That one starts at $200,000. It makes 443 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.4 seconds, has a top speed of 158. The fuel economy, the MPGE rating is 46, just like this XM, and the E range is just around 18 miles. Among those, I pretty quickly rule out the Bentley Bentayga Hybrid. I just think it's too expensive for what you're getting in terms of performance or efficiency. But the Cayenne Turbo SE Hybrid is more compelling. It's not only got lots of power, quick in a straight line, and has decent efficiency, but it's got great steering feel. It feels like a driver's SUV, in addition to the fact that the design is more cohesive than the XM. The XM has some cool angles to it. I just think that it looks too disjointed styling-wide. But if you're on the flashier side, you're gonna appreciate this look compared to the more subtle Cayenne SE Hybrid. And there are a lot of good things to say about this interior. It's very luxurious. It's got lots of great technology. It feels more premium than the Cayenne. I just, I think for me, I really just latch on to the fact that this is an M, M specific product and it doesn't feel fully M. It's got great performance but on the level of like a really good BMW M Sport product, not an M specific model. Maybe that's gonna be cured with the label red version of this car that's coming out with more power and all that. But then why not just only have this as the label red? Why even have this model at all? Or, or why not just have it as a BMW version? It just, it seems confusing to me. And the pieces don't necessarily meld together as well as I think they should for this money. It's way better than I expected. I've got to say that. I did not have high expectations and it has really blown those away. But if it were me and I wanted something like this, I would get that Cayenne. What do you guys think though? Would you have the XM? Would you have the Cayenne Turbo SE Hybrid? Would you have the Bentayga Hybrid? Let me know in the comments. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell to get notified. I'll see you next time.